So good afternoon. Thank you so much for, for joining us um, for our professional development event this month. We have Pam Brooks joining us today, and she'll be um, discussing the managing in the middle, that middle management, and it sounds like we have a lot to go over today. So Pam, I will go ahead and pass it off to you. Um, and we can get started for today. Awesome. Thanks, Abby. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, this is the managing in the middle. I started working on this class um, about a year ago, and I used to teach mastering leadership for leadership and workforce development, which is really managing in the middle. And I would say this could be a nine month class. Like I'm not going to be able to cover it all today, let alone jump in and actually tackle some of the skill sets. But what I've given this in the past, I'm just trying to raise awareness around the issues that make middle management so hard. So if you're in middle management, you don't go like, God, I'm all alone. I feel like I can't conquer what's going on. I'm hoping to kind of give a framework to go, here's what's going on. Here's why you feel what you feel and maybe some directions for further training for you as you want to dive in. If I have enough time, if I can make enough time, I will do what's called Trioki Consulting at the end and we can break out so that we can get in some teams of either two or three and well, actually three and practice some sharing and, and caring, if you will, about how to resolve issues. So managing the middle, let's dive in. Um, I'm hoping that as we walk through this, I know that everybody's really busy right now. It's getting to that crunch right before the holidays and the end of the semester of running and gunning, but try to just be present for now. I will make sure that Abby gets a copy of this slide deck so that you can have access to it. Don't scramble for notes and th that way you can just pick up and take this and think about your situation now and apply the information to your situation. So to start out with, and since we're small, I'm going to let you unmute, but I want to find out if you could develop one superpower as a leader right now, like that would just help you conquer, get better at, or do something with your job. What would that superpower look like? And as an example, I did this the other day and I had a group of people go, God, I would want to be able to manage and stop time so that I had enough time to do all the things I needed to do. <laughs> so it's an example. I was actually going to say read people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that would be scary. Sometimes I don't know yeah. what people are thinking. <laughs> scary, but maybe useful. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Great, Amy. I love it. I think mine would be not dwelling on things I don't have control over. That would be a good power. Absolutely. That's a good one, Renee. I think mine, and I like Amy, yours is more like of those superpowers that, that we know of. I was thinking mine would be some type of like to, to give motivation to our employees, right? Especially Pam, as you mentioned, as we were getting started, we're at that, that part of the semester, holidays are coming up, those longer breaks are coming up. Um, everybody's starting to, their mindset starting to, to kind of drift a little bit, right? So that motivation, if I could give motivation to everybody, including myself, I would love that superpower. <laughs> Oh, God, that's great. Awesome. And Amy stole mine. I was going to say read people's minds. I just want to know, like, what people are thinking when they're scared or don't want to do something. Like, what's what's the story behind that? Like I said, sometimes you might not want to know. And then the reality you find out is that they don't even know what they're thinking. <laughs> I find that too. All right, moving on, because I just find this one interesting to think about too, like in terms of middle management, if there was a skill set that would help me get through that something, what is that? So, all right, so we've kind of talked about superpowers. So let's let's kind of dive into some reality of what's really going on right now in the middle management, especially in education. So this has been labeled the great resignation. Um, it's been labeled as high turnover. This is stuff that's going on, not just in education, but outside of education. And I think ASU is lucky that it's not dealing with some of the same stuff that some of the other institutions are, but it has its own issues per se, from the standpoint that there's a lot of universities that have had to cut back, cut back, cut back, because they don't have the enrollment. And the issue is like expanding, 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 because we have super enrollment. Um, but it still adds some of that same kind of pressure and challenge. Um, if we look at stats worldwide, and this was um, some stuff taken from a podcast 
from Brene Singh that the burnout, um, changes in priorities, changes in our relationships, because we're not all face-to-face, -face, we're hybrid, we've been dealing with Zoom for so long. There's just so much going on that impacts us, especially looming over us that we're going to have the economic big recession coming. You know, back in 2008, there was one, and now we're going to have this other one kind of looming out there. And what does that going to do for us? And so we as a, as a person, let alone managing, have to cope with some of these things. And when we look at the Gallup State of Work, which came out, um, I think this one was, there's one in 2017, there's another one that just came out, which I have a video on, shows this horrible thing that people will leave because of their boss. And so I'm like, who in the world would want to be in middle management? Because you get blamed for everything. Like, oh, if a person doesn't want to work anymore, oh, you're the problem. We can go out and tell stories and justify ourselves for not making it because of our manager. And so it's, it's hard because what is it that people hang their hat on? They say that they're not credible, they're inflexible, they don't speak honestly, they alienate us, they're passive aggressive. And so I'm like, wow, what is it about the position that creates the appearance of this to the people below? Because I don't think anybody intends to go out and speak dishonestly. I don't think anybody goes out and intends to alienate the lower people from the top people realistically. And yet there's these perceptions. And so again, like an HBR article here, it talks about how engagement has been declining and the new stats are just as bad. Like right now, they say disengagement is at an all-time high. I think one stat said it was at 20%. And I was like, dang, really would love to know how they gather all of it. But it's just that kind of ominous thing, which puts a lot of weight on that middle manager. You know, like Abby, you said, I would love to motivate people. <laughs> how do we do it? So this is actually from 2021. And this is Gallup just bringing up some stats. And so I just thought they did a great job. A couple minutes, I'm going to play it for you. The world experienced a pandemic in 2020. We did not all experience it the same way. Last year, Gallup asked workers in every region of the world about key issues affecting their lives. The insights from these questions developed our newest iteration of the State of the Global Workplace Report. Here are some of our discoveries. Globally, employee engagement is dismally low. The majority of full-time workers in the world are either watching the clock or actively opposing their employer. This disengagement creates a drag on productivity, innovation and organisational change. The workforce reported higher stress, worry, anger and sadness than the previous year. Negative emotions increased more for women than men and more for workers under 40 than those over 40. Given the hospitalizations, as well as lockdowns, closed schools, increased remote work and unemployment, these numbers are not surprising. They represent the frustrations and struggles of millions of workers across the planet. As employers rethink and restart their workplaces, there is still hope for the future. Most urgently, leaders must take action on the importance of overall employee well-being and engagement for workforce resilience, from physical health to loneliness, financial hardship to community support. All these factors influence the enthusiasm and productivity of workers. Successful corporations of the future will not only generate profits, but will also generate thriving employees who are capable of weathering crises. So you can just in the chat window, um, what's something that struck you from that little clip from Gallup? Or you can unmute because there's a small portion of you. Um, I thought the unengagement part, um, just record levels of unengagement was interesting. Okay. Anybody else struck by something in it? Like all the different emotions that people feel, like they mentioned all those different emotions, like more people were angry and that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, you know, I felt all of those things too. Like, 
like after a certain amount of time of like things being a certain way, some things you recognize are positive changes and some things that you have no control over just made it more difficult for you to just manage your emotions. And some of those more negative emotions were definitely like, I noticed that even in my team, like people felt just generally more negative. <laughs> okay. So some of it you may know, some of you don't. I just, I bring it in because we're in a level of management, even compared to when I was back teaching the hardline class, that there's been shifts and there's been some changes in things that almost require more retooling and not even from the standpoint of management, but just managers have to be so much more on top of knowing themselves and what's got them going before you know you can go out and help others. It's like the old adage that you get on an airplane and the stewardess or steward will go, hey, take that oxygen mask and put it over your face first before you give it to somebody else. And leadership used to be all about servanthood. And we always thought like, no, give the mask to the other people. And we're at a point now where we have to be very mindful to take care of ourselves. And what does that look like? And what are the issues that if I can take care of myself and I learn how to do it, I can pass that on and try to help the people underneath. And I'll just say that there's no one class, one training, although I would say my Brene Brown really touch, teaches a lot. But <laughs> I don't think in itself is enough on its own. So um, I will be uh, trying to give some more of those out as well. But I just, again, I think when I think about Brene's training and why I think it is so helpful is because it's actual tools and skills and new understanding that helps people realize, especially in management, that we're not alone. We're dealing with some things and grassroots. What can I put? What's a tool I can put in my toolbox that's going to help me and help the next person get through? And that's really kind of more of where we're at in, in what we need. So safety first in terms of understanding stuff. I bring this up. I'm certified in conversational intelligence, and I just always have to bring this back in because you have to understand the neuroscience that is affecting you as a leader right now. You, you can't just go in and go, I'm going to be fine. I'm great. I'm, I'm whatever. You need to understand that you can be triggered like everybody else on your staff. You know, Renee, when you said, oh man, I felt those heck along with the people I'm working with, like I felt those. And we have to understand that when we are in that phase ourselves of being angry or frustrated or kind of sunk down and sullen because it can, it, you know, we can go the full spectrum, we're going to have stress hormones within us if something doesn't go right. And I think about our days sometime, you know, maybe things don't go at home the way that they should, or things are different now because we have to work from home, right? So it creates this whole new bind of my kid didn't frustrate me, but now the kid is noisy in the background and I got to do it. Or even my dog is noisy in the background and I love my dog, but my dog won't shut up. Like little things that weren't stressors are now stressors for us. And it's like, what is that? It's creating this arousal. And if we have two kicks in the morning where we have something that goes on and then we have another kick, we get out in traffic and it was bad or we get the, the second thing, we're getting all these impacts that are increasing the stress hormones, but we're not getting them to kick down. We're not getting them to turn off. We're not stopping for a moment to go, okay, got through that. I actually missed the fact that when I used to schedule things, I had 20 minutes extra. So like, I got to get to this part on campus. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to drive. I'm going to walk up. And it was that time to regather your head before you went into the meeting. And now it's like, oh, I'm sorry, got to go. And you shut one Zoom off and you open the next Zoom up and you run into it. And you're like, your head's still spinning, trying to finish the last one. And you're trying to listen to the next one. And so these are all things that are compounding that stress without letting it come back. And then you think about the positive hormones over here where they talk, she talks about co-creating and the we and where we're connecting because we don't have the face-to-face because we can't just walk down the hall. And for me, it was like, God, I'm going through something. It's like, I'd pop up and I'd look over the cubicle at my partner and go, do you got a minute? And she'd be like, sure, Pam, or no, not right now, but maybe in 30. Like I missed that connection of just being able to go, there's somebody there and I can just talk out a situation and make it happen. Now it's like, I got to set a phone call or I got to set a Zoom. 
And, and we've lost almost that art of going, hey, I'm just going to pick up my phone and I'm going to call them and get them on the phone because we don't want to interrupt a meeting or maybe they're at home and we, oh, I don't want to interrupt what's going on. We, so we're not getting our connections in the same way that we used to. And I know for myself, going remote before remote was the thing because I moved out to Mass before COVID hit. I remember just going, how am I going to connect with people? How am I going to make that space? And I purposely had to do different things to go, this is a time for me just to connect with a peer to find out what's going on on campus. Like I used to do when I went to lunch with someone or this time is specifically set up to talk to a particular group of people or trying to get myself included in meetings that I used to just be able to go, oh, there's a meeting, can I join that? Okay, cool. Like, I don't know when the meetings are going on. I don't know which ones I wanna be a part of and where information, I mean, I don't need to contribute, but sometimes I just go, God, that would be great information to get and I'm not getting it. So this is important to note as well, because from a neural chemical standpoint, the stress hormones can last in our body for up to 12 hours. So we are constantly carrying more stress if we're not doing something to relieve it. Our people are carrying more stress if we're not getting them to try to find a way to relieve it. And now we have to even more purposefully find ways to make the connections, be it when we're hybrid and we know that there's a specific day and everybody can come in. Normally we go, oh, God, we're going to have to get all of our meetings done during that day when everybody comes in. And it's like, everybody comes in and we're all stressed out because we've got the face-to-face -face and we're not connecting. So we need to understand, we need five positive things from a, like just straight equation. We need five positive things to one negative to keep ourselves balanced. And as we go through this, we have to be mindful of the fact that there's a lot of things triggering our stress side. And we just have to be able to go, okay, mindful, meeting start. Where's everybody at? Okay, let's check in. Let's, let's figure this out. Take a deep breath and then start to move into what is going to connect us in different ways. So just want to state one of the big learnings from Brene's book, um, which I have done a 14 week series on, and we'll start again um, in a little bit, but um, our fear is what leads to our poor behavior. Because when we're afraid that we're not measuring up and we don't know who we're measuring up to, but we have this like feeling like we're not doing all the things that we used to and, and we should be able to get these things done. Fear, shame, disconnect. That's what leads us to doing abnormal behaviors. Like we either stick our head in the sand or we board ourselves up, whatever it is. And sometimes we armor up. That's why you have all the, the higher bouts of anger too. So we need to do things that definitely promote more psychological safety. And I, one of my things I know, and, and I might add before you, but it's like, let's just have a class on psychological safety because this is really important to understand that these are where our triggers come from. When we don't get these, the negative happens. When we don't get these, we feel a state of distrust with the people around us. And so there's a need for security and commitment and certainty. Like we like to know how things are going to be. We, we like to know we can lean on it. And I had this conversation with my husband and he's frustrated because his people, which are normally front facing because of the facilities are trying to get a hold of HR, which is now oh, gone. And nobody replies, like nobody picks up their phone, nobody answers an email until a day and a half later. And so they have no certainty, like we have a problem, we need it dealt with, like nobody deals with it, <laughs> goes off into air. So those are things, and to get people to at least address, understand, and then move towards what will create more certainty. We have a need for autonomy, that we have choices. And so there's that mix between, well, I want to be able to work from home, and I want to be able to kind of set my hours, and yet at the same token, as a group, we used to all be connected. We all used to be there. And so it's this mindful say, spot of saying at least three days a week, if you're on a team, there's four hours blocked that you need to be available because everybody else is making that same block so that we have choices around that, but that we have also this ability to create the commitment needed to get the things done. Um, fairness of exchange. This one's being brought up right now because those people that are front facing and return to work and those people that are working remote now suffer from a new bias of the facing bias. Like the people are there, the boss sees them, they respond to them, they give them the work and the person that's offsite isn't there, isn't sometimes making the connection. And so how do we mindfully create the fairness of exchange now that there's been differences put into it? And we like to be esteemed as equals, but again, if two people are at work and they have conversations because they're front facing and they're seeing it and that other person isn't there and isn't a part of a meeting, they're going to feel left out. 
and and not that there's a purposeful like you are not equal there's just that appearance of and that feeling of that starts to create it and unless we talk about it we have issues and so the other part is for us to show up and that i think is probably one of the toughest things for us is to be able to show up in a mindful way and i know in the beginning of covid there was a lot where people were actually being open and saying yeah i'm dealing with that too i'm dealing with that too but now we're on two years of it and we're like to be over are we going to get to a point where we can figure out what this new process is going to look like so psychological definitely a class in here would help in what we do um, creating safety agreements with your team so we talk about how do we want to treat each other this is an example of one that i did with the team where we just said okay based on these needs for security and how we need to treat each other what does that look like how are we going to do this how are we going to respect ourselves um, be it in a Zoom setting or non-Zoom setting where we are going to talk directly to people about things that we have open, honest, confidential, whatever conversation. Or when we have a question, it's okay for us to call somebody on the phone, like during this certain hours or whatever, whatever that is for your group. It's important to kind of set that down because we don't have rules to live on. I think when we met face to face, there's kind of those unwritten rules and they didn't change and they didn't shift on us but now they do so let's put some up let's talk about it let's go here's what we can expect to create more again of that safety and I think the other thing that I do in Brene Brown's group and I've done it with thing is to have the team call like to courage or the team something that you're going to work on that's outside of the deadlines the work the duties the actual tasks you have to do that say hey this semester let's be better about connecting with each other for at least 30 minutes every week, like cross connecting with people so that you, you know, maybe not if your group is big, maybe not, but that you at least cross connect with two other people this week for 30 minutes that you don't normally talk to on a regular basis. Because those are what build organizations. When I was in my master's degree, we used to study what was called uh, systems theory. And we didn't just study the hierarchy and the structure we literally studied the connections between two people how many different topics do you share with all these people and they actually could map it out almost like 3d and they could show you the strength of an organization based on the number of connections that people have and you could see the bridges where there's this cluster and there's this one person that leaps over and they meet with this other group over here and they bring the information back to this team so that they can share across those things and we're losing those connections and that's giving us that instability and that part that we need. So creating, a again, a team, something that you go, God, here's what we're going to work on for the semester this time because of, you know, whatever it is. And then set what that, what that looks like so that you're revisiting that one thing you want to work on outside of a work that's going to build either your team security, your team trust, your team connectedness. And the idea for that is because since we're starting to lose some of that safety, our ability to move up to what's called challenger safety has become more difficult. Inclusion safety, um, not we can all feel like, hey, I'm on the team, you're on the team, yeah, we connect, whatever. But it's still not quite the same because we're not in person, but we can pretty much get through stage one. Learner safety is now the ability to go, I'm learning new information and I know who I can go to and ask questions of. Um, I know where I can get support for what I need. And this one has been challenged because, God, I'm a new worker and I was hired remote. And well, I know that's my boss and I'm going to call him. But I was hired to do this job and so I should be able to figure it out. Right. And so I won't maybe ask the questions. I won't lean into it until unless we purposefully set up a time for learners to feel like they can express and learn and, and do those things. But it's an integral part. We have to move up and we have to feel like we can make mistakes and learn from them. Then there's contributor safety, where we feel like we can put our ideas out there and have a met. When it used to be face to face, I'd go, the worst part is like if you put an idea out and somebody steals it. Nowadays, it's like, well, I don't, I don't think my opinion matters. So we don't contribute in the Zoom window. We just sit there and go home. Oh, we nod our head. Like we, we're not getting the same type of stuff. So it requires a different tool set, some different facilitation to make sure I'm pulling everybody's ideas out as a leader in a way that we haven't had to before. And there's some great, I want to say, things on facilitation, another class, you want to take it, facilitation, like it is the leader skill set that you've got to put, the tool in the toolbox that will help you understand how can I pull more information out in a fair and unbiased way from people. 
And then the last one is challenger safety. And this is where we can put ideas out and have somebody critique them, have somebody give feedback on it. And I think this is really hard because as a manager, you, you kind of put in a position, which we'll talk about later, to coach and help people. And yet you also want to get feedback yourself. And because everybody is so emotionally like, ooh, feedback, oh, 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 that's conflict, man. I don't, I'm not going to challenge anything. If I challenge it, then it's going to put me out on a limb. And, and so this is a, a much different process to get to the point that we can create spaces for this. So again, kind of a mindful one. Now, the other part that I find just in general of middle management, aside from the issues right now, is these, I almost want to say, things that we have to like cope with that create dissonance or senses of, God, this is just something I haven't done before and I don't know where my strength is. And it's transitioning from the work to the manager. And I think a lot of times it's like, we're just told, okay, yeah, no, you, you've done so well at your job. Like, we'll just put you in management responsibility. And it's like, it is so different from being a player to being a coach. And the same is true of being a worker versus being a manager. And there's some aspects of that transition that we now do have an emerging supervisor class for people to take out of leadership and workforce development, which is cool because it's at least making you aware of the fact when I make that transition, there's going to be some awkward moments and it's okay. And here's some things you can do to get through it. You know, just as an example, um, I'm working next to, you know, Betty and we're really good friends, but now all of a sudden I move up into a supervisor supervisor position and now I'm supervising Betty and that makes a shift to our relationship and if I'm not aware of it and I don't know how to set new boundaries about it in the right way I'm going to lose that relationship or that relationship could sour and now that's even going to create more conflict because Betty could go out and get oh, she's got that and, the da, da, da. and then now you've got even more issues to deal with as a manager right so there's different things in that transition and skill sets that are needed and when you first do it you're going to like feel a little strange, a little awkward. So um, the supervisory development, the emerging class, those are all things that can help you with that transition. Finding a mentor, somebody, not just your boss, but somebody else that's made this step that you can just go, hey, God, I was at work and this happened. You have to build that support network to help you through. Um, the grappling with demands of new roles. So a lot of times you still have to do your initial responsibilities. This is totally as you more with less, right? And now you've got to figure out how to have these difficult conversations, how to set expectations of people and meet production challenges and still do your job. And it's like, dang, like now I'm dealing with other people and they have different motivation or they have different ways of doing things. And it's like, how do I shift to understand what some of those are? Along with the fact that we are at, at the most heightened point of relations, relational issues with diversity, equity, inclusion, and I should put the B in there, belonging um, at a professional level that we have to become aware of. And I myself still make mistakes. I was coaching somebody this last week and I've known him for probably, I don't know, four or five years. He used to come to my live classes and had conversations. And I had no idea who his partner was, but I didn't state it like that. My initial response was, I thought he had a wife. I thought somewhere in my mind that he had been married and had a wife. And I was like, oh, he goes, no, no, I have a partner. And I was like, <laughs> and I can apologize like crazy, but we still have those things and we have to find ways to work through those um, and know that we're going to mess up sometimes and then to just create the fix to, to continue the conversation and to work through those things, especially with the person so that we don't offend them and turn those situations into things that actually help grow relationships. Um, the managing up and down of information, hands down, this is the one from, I want to say, dealing with some of the directors and executive directors that I dealt with, the managing up of not just information, but managing who their leader is up above and what information they give them and how to manage the distribution of the information below, because there's things that you discover in middle management that you can't tell the people below. You are basically told, you know this, they don't know this don't tell them. And now you're operating in a state of almost incongruence with yourself because what's the one thing you want to do? You want to go tell the people, right? Because it affects them. And so you have this like, how do I conquer what it is that I can tell, live with myself about the things that I can't, 
and know that I also have to manage and push back sometimes and say, hey, like that's really important. And we do need to address this with the people down here. And I know you want to keep it hush and hush, but at some point we have to. Um, the team management, all kinds of issues with that. Collaborating across the organization, new challenge, because we can't always just go to that meeting across campus and connect in and find out who our resources are. Um, and then balancing our demands with outside of work. And then they expect you to have a backup plan for everything, as well as the fact that you are really in a marathon, but you're constantly on a sprint every week and going, I can't keep this up. Like, I'm not going to make it to the end of that finish line. So again, just open, acknowledge. And I want to say journaling is a great thing. But as you look at these issues and you go, oh, man, like just spew sometimes during a week. And I know it feels like you're wasting time, but if you take 30 minutes at least once a week, and just put out all the things that you're dealing with and looking at it and then going, okay, out of all the stuff that I just put out of my chaos, what's my priority? What can I get to? What can I actually like impact? Or who can I go to as a resource to help with something? Will help you deal with these instead of letting them sit there and roll around in your head and build up more and more and more stress. So lots going on. So this is that part again, where we have some real challenges sometimes like that that managing of information where we know what we stand for and if you've not done a value sort I would say that's a great place to start to know what it is that you really stand for because it will help you with all the decisions you make it will help you understand what you're willing to bend on and what you're not and so as that middle managers we have to put some boundaries around us about what we will do what we can't do um timelines we can meet not meet and at the same token, we have to have this generosity, especially to the people below where we have to understand, or even sometimes generosity up where people make a decision and you look at it and go, why would they make that decision? That is going to like, and then we want to go to that state of judgment where we want to jump up and go, no, nah, you can't do that. How do we keep open and curious as to why would, would the decision be being made? At the same token of being generous to some of the things that we see with the people below, but still operate in our point of integrity. And it's hard because anytime that we get challenged where what we think about ourselves and what we do is not congruent, we have cognitive dissonance. We literally have a state of going, just don't like myself, or I don't like this position that I've been put in. And when we have to like contradicting or two sides that are pulling us in different directions, that isn't a frustration that just goes away. It, it will be there the next day when you show up to work. It will be there the next time that kind of decision comes to the forefront until we learn how to resolve those. So I'm going to play just a little clip from this video right here. Um, I think she does a really good job of kind of expressing what this is. And then I'm going to bring up after this some of the continuums that you will probably find yourself in this state of dissonance about. In this video, you're going to learn about cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when we have a gap between what we believe is right and what we're doing. That, that creates dissonance in our lives. This means that we believe one thing, but we're acting on something else. Dissonance feels like having one foot on one boat and the other foot on another boat. As the two boats, as our actions and our beliefs drift further apart, the more uncomfortable we get. When we have unresolved gaps between our thoughts and our actions, we feel intensely uncomfortable. You can do all the coping and the meditation and the self-care that you can handle, but if you can't figure out cognitive dissonance, you're just not gonna feel good. There is no substitute for integrity when it comes to peace of mind. So for example, Jenny knows that she should exercise more. It's not that she's obese or anything, but her body feels slow and sluggish and she gets out of breath when she's walking up a flight of stairs. She knows that she would feel better if she worked out. And each day that she doesn't exercise, she feels a tinge of disappointment and guilt. Now, dissonance makes us feel bad. Dissonance makes us feel unsettled or guilty or uncertain. Dissonance makes us feel fake or bad about ourselves. And this feeling isn't just in our minds, it creates measurable physical tension. And this isn't a bad thing, right? Discomfort can help us be motivated to change. This is strongest when it has to do with a belief about ourselves. 
So for example, the thought, you know, I value kindness paired with the action, oh, I just punched someone in the face is going to bring on some pretty strong feelings of regret and guilt and disappointment. When we resolve dissonance, we can feel more peace. We can like ourselves more and we can feel clarity. The opposite of dissonance is integrity. Integrity is not just about being honest with our words. Integrity means that we line up our actions with our values. And in my opinion, integrity is the path to positive self-worth, to more peaceful emotions and a successful, purposeful life. Integrity is all about closing the gap between what we think and how we act. Resolving cognitive dissonance is essential to living a life of purpose, meaning, joy, and growth. So if you want to get better at feeling and if you want to feel peaceful, then you need to learn what to do with those gaps in your life. Go ahead and write about one area in your life where your actions don't line up with your beliefs or your values. How does this affect you? How do you feel about yourself in regards to it? It's essential to acknowledge and resolve these conflicts as much as possible. When they're left to just simmer, it leaves us feeling false and helpless and insecure. Dissonance leaves us feeling uncomfortable and false, and integrity can lead to us feeling secure and capable and whole. Now, there are three ways to resolve dissonance, but not all are equal. So the first one is to change our behavior to line up with our values. So whenever our values are positive and helpful, changing our behavior is usually the best way to close the gap. So let's explore what this would look like with Jenny, right? It, it sounds so simple, but if she were to start finding a way to exercise a little bit each day, her feeling of dissonance would be replaced by a feeling of pride. That seems basic enough, right? When we change our behaviors to line up with our values, the dissonance goes away. This works great when our values are positive and helpful, the kind of person we want to be. You don't have to be perfect to be moving in a good direction. What matters most is that you're putting an effort to live the way that you think you should be. Okay, the second way to close this gap is to change our thinking to line up with our behavior. So sometimes our emotions are built on faulty beliefs. Um, we need to change how we think, right? In that case, we need to change our thinking to line up with our values and our behaviors instead of trying to change our actions to try and reach some impossible goal. So this is common with um, perfectionism or all or nothing thinking or with impossible expectations. So if you remember it with the example, Jenny thinks she needs to exercise more, right? And she's not doing it. So in the previous way of solving that problem, she exercised more and then she felt better. Now, what if Jenny actually has an eating disorder and she's already exercising three to four hours a day, but she knows that this isn't enough. She thinks, oh, if I only worked out more, I would like myself. She, she beats herself up. She says, you know, why am I so lazy, right? So in this case, her distorted thinking has led to these unrealistic standards for herself that aren't healthy. So what does she need to do to resolve her feelings of inadequacy? She thinks she needs to work out more, but she can't, so she feels bad, right? She needs to change her thinking to line up with reality. She needs to place more value on health and moderation and improve her sense of self-worth and let go of these perfectionistic ideals that are keeping her sick and making her miserable. So when she changes her thinking to line up with a healthier set of behaviors, like, you know, exercising less than an hour every day, then she can feel more peace with her thoughts and actions. So that's, that's the second way to close that gap as we change how we think to line up with our values. Now, the third way to close this gap is the worst option for trying to resolve gaps, right? It is justifying our behavior. So justifying attempts to resolve this feeling of dissonance by numbing, blaming, avoiding, or just excusing the fact that we have a gap, right? So going back to the standing on two boats analogy, as the two boats separate, your legs begin to stretch apart and weaken, and it becomes painful and harder to stand. But instead of climbing aboard one boat to relieve the pain or pulling the two boats together, you just keep taking Tylenol, right? You just pop a bunch of painkillers. This is what justification does. Your problem isn't solved, but at least it doesn't hurt as much. Now, this is obviously a bad situation, but despite the harm that justifying causes, research shows that it's the most common way people do respond when they've done something wrong. Okay. I want to move on here. Most of the time... Summarize here. So when we talk about integrity, because Brene's big on integrity, integrity is... Here's what we value. Here's how we think about ourselves or what we really want ourselves to be. 
And we're doing that and we're feeling that and, and our actions display it. Dissonance is the opposite of that at any point in time when our thoughts of who we are doesn't line up with our actions. Here's the kicker. It, dissonance can be caused by our own thoughts of inadequacy. I'm comparing, which Brene says be careful of. We, we do compare because that helps us know what we need to improve, but that's different. I'm looking for what I need to improve in and I'm seeing it and I'm going to take and own part of those things to do it. Whereas comparison goes, I'm not that good or I'm not there. I'm not, that's an unhealthy comparison, right? But dissonance can be caused because I in my head think ill of myself dissonance can be caused because somebody outside of us puts us in a spot to make us feel ill of ourselves or question ourselves by what they say or do with us. And so in the middle management, it's really easy to get caught in that because you can get feedback from above about what you haven't gotten done or what well, if you were a good leader, this would happen. And then you're like, I am a good leader, but I don't know how to deal with it, right? Or the vice versa, where somebody down below now puts on you, just as we talked about how many people blame their manager for their unhappy feelings, and they put you in that spot of feeling like you're a bad manager. And so we have to be able to resolve and go, here's who I am, this is what I value, and I'm doing the best that I can. And with that, then as stuff comes in, you take it, you, you look at it and go, is this something that I need to pull and do something about? Or is this one of those, like, I'm just going to get a lot of negative input, a lot of negative things, and I need to just let some of it go because it's not relevant for me and to take that out. So we have to be aware of where are we feeling these things. And again, sometimes we can change our behavior. Oh, that's cool. Easy fix. Yep, we can do that. Awesome. Then you feel good about yourself because you've met an expectation. Sometimes we have to change our thinking to line up with the behavior. There's an example in a book that I'm reading right now. <clears throat> on immunity to change. And there's a guy and he's got this real strong desire to start delegating. He's got too much on his plate. He can't get enough done. And he knows he needs to prioritize and get some of the stuff off his thing. And he's tried it for months and months and it's not working. And so this group comes in to coach him and they go, okay, we know, you know, you need to do it. You know what delegation is. What are you doing now? What is it that you're actually doing now to try to pull out of him where he's at? And he's like, well, I'm looking for all these new opportunities. And I take a ton of time to look at these opportunities because I don't want to miss them. Cool. Understand that. But now I take all the time to do these things. I'm not really getting to my own responsibilities. And I feel guilty giving my work to somebody else because I don't think that's fair. As a leader, I shouldn't be dishing my work on somebody else. And they go, oh, well, where does that feeling of dishing your work at somebody else come from? And he goes, oh, well, when I first started working and I was, you know, this you know, low-end employee, like I had all these responsibilities. And I think the one thing I hated most is when somebody else in the same job left me all their work to do. Oh, well, you in that type of position now? He's like, no, you're in a leadership position. Yes. So delegating is not handing off your job responsibility. Delegating is a part of your responsibility. Delegating is teaching somebody else how to do something and is very mindful and very proactive. And it was that thing Oh, so now I don't have to feel guilty. And he became more mindful about not just dumping what he didn't want to do, but giving work to people for a specific purpose to teach them and was able to start delegating. So what did he have to do? He had to change the thinking. Sometimes you change behavior. Sometimes you change thinking. When do you know you need to do this? When you're doing the rationalization part, blaming others. Oh, that's not my fault. This is the, and, and, and we move into that very easy because if we have the days where tons coming at us, that's going to be where we go. Excuse making, denial, extreme statements, con you know, convincing others that you're doing it the right way. Different. If we find certain areas that we're doing that in, that's where we need to take the spotlight and go, okay, I need to unpack this a little bit more. I need to figure out what I'm really feeling apprehensive about and how do I make the better change, either by changing a specific behavior or changing my thinking to line up with it, but not to sit in a state of rationalizing, so to speak, where all I'm taking is Tylenol, but I'm not getting rid of that stressor. That's where we start having compounding stress over time. So what does this look like in middle management besides delegating? There's this push by the organization that there's a need for change, that the people underneath you want stability. Oh God, we keep changing every week. That rule keeps changing. Like, man, it's hard. Um, we have a need for learning and taking risks. And yet we also have this need for security and following tradition. You have a need to collaborate, and yet everybody says you need to take that time for yourself to focus on what you need to do. 
And so we're getting pushed and pulled in all of these areas. And if we don't take time, different for people, different for different positions and who you are, we don't take time to look at those and think about, okay, this is how I'm going to mindfully move forward. This is the realistic picture for me on how much time I need to take to myself. And here's the time I'm going to take for collaboration. We will just let ourselves be pushed and pulled in those directions. And then when we're doing more collaboration and not getting time to ourselves, we feel bad, but we can't put our finger on and say, that's why. We just feel bad. And so it's good to sometimes look and examine of those areas that were kind of sit in different areas. Now, one more of middle management, which I love, comes from Simon Sinek. And I'll make sure you get a copy of this so that you can play this video. It's really good. And he wrote a book about the infinite game. And what this concept is, is that when you're an organization and you're doing things, it's kind of like there are some things that's like a game, be it football or basketball. There's a defined timeline. The rules are clear. You know when the game starts, you know when the game ends, you know who wins because these are the rules and here's how you play it. That is the finite game. The issue is, is that the reality of our university is not just the semester to semester, oh, we got through classes, the people got their grades, check. We're in an infinite game of changing the way that education is happening. On each year, we increase more people, we increase new programs, we try new things. And so we have both this finite game going on, but we also have an infinite game going on. And middle management is stuck in both worlds. You have to manage the finite game of your workers, making sure that everything is getting done and checked. But you're a part a little bit of the infinite game going on about where is it we're going. And that can be hard sometimes because you have to figure out how much of the infinite game you let down to the people below and incorporate into what's happening in a finite state. And what out of the finite state rules and things need to change in order to incorporate to make, match the infinite game. So it's another one to look at in terms of pressures you may feel at times and what's there because it's it's reality. No. Okay. Um, paradigm shifts. These are other things that you deal with because we've went from a process type thing because process has always been important to the new shift that we really have to value people. And sometimes we're starting to almost value people at the extreme of losing process and outcomes. And yet you're still responsible for the process and outcomes, right? Paradigm shift, take all this time, to, you know, make sure you make connections, make sure you do all these things. And yet at the same token, we still have to get something out the door. We have to meet demands. And so this era of agile is a new kind of way of dealing with that finite versus infinite game. The rules have changed. So now it's like there's a basketball game and instead of going, it's four quarters and we know at the fourth quarter it's done, it's like, well, we're just going to take this quarter by quarter and we're going to stop at the end of the first quarter and go, go, where are we? And there's kind of that big infinite, you know, part out there that we're getting to, but we're going to go, where are we at right now? Let's huddle up. Let's think about it and go, what's going to get us closer to that, that larger win. And then you go to the next quarter and you, you try some new things and you do some things and you keep making adjustments. You know, if you talk to any coach, they will tell you that the team that adjusts last wins. The team that has the ability to adjust and do it readily wins. And so how do we kind of deal with this? This is another area where you can get some really cool training in agile in terms of how do I bring my teams together? How do I work at kind of like facilitation? Um, all right. And I know I'm coming up close here. <laughs> This is, but this is something that I will tell you that is one of the things that definitely do. And whether yeah, I can even send you a values deck, I can send you the cards, Abby, um, to find the two things that you just go, this is what I stand for. I did work with the PBS group before I left to come out here. And I remember going and meeting with them. And I said, what do you value? And I said, don't tell me what's on the wall. I don't want that. What do you guys value? Go, I don't know. We've never really talked about it. So I did a value sort with them and I made everybody do one for themselves first and pick out of this deck of cards, what do you value? And they're like, I've never done this. There's a couple maybe that did and there's others that were like, God, this is really hard. And then they looked at their friend and the friend goes, oh, that's definitely you. Why? Because I know you do all your decisions based on that. 
But when we do it, it's like this great bias. Like when you go buy a new car, you see how many other people have that same car. If I put my values down and I put them up, I realize how much they influence everything that I do. So it's a selective attention that can help you. It gives you that sweet spot of understanding what is your personal sense of purpose? Why do I do what I do? Then you take it in and go, how does this impact my role and what I do in my role? Because then I'll feel better about what I do in my role. And then to roll that in one step further of how, what I feel is important and what I do in my job and how does that help the organizational purpose? And I know a lot of people are ASU because we all buy into that Kool-Aid of the organizational purpose is we are about inclusion, not exclusion. Like that is such a great thing to be a part of. But sometimes we don't think about how does my day-to-day -day roll into what's really happening within my team or my organization and roll out. And statistics will show that people who know what their day-to-day -day does impacts the bottom line, impacts the outcome, feel better about what they do. And so when I meet my values and I know what I've done and I've reached that, helps. I mean, I know when I was doing my master's degree, they used to study nurses and wanted to know why there was such a burnout rate on oncology. Well, at that time, they used to put a nurse, you're an intake nurse and you're a distribution nurse and um, you're, you're this. And so a nurse never got to see a patient all the way through the cycle they did one aspect of it. So one person got to see the administering of chemo and went, ah. they never got to see the patient succeed and live afterwards. And so it's so important to see where does that end come? And as a middle manager, that's one thing you can do is to provide those connections and to make sure that you have them and to make sure you get them from the people up above so that you can have the stories to share back and say, hey, you know that project you work on, it did this, it did this, and it's really impacted here, it's awesome, okay? Um, all right. The other thing is the shift in regards to the skill sets needed. I want to say it was always there, but I swear I can look at leaders today and go, how did they get there? Just watch the political elections and you just go, how did that person even get elected? <laughs> did, how does somebody with that kind of reputation get where they're going? Like it doesn't happen. And yet I think about everybody in their regular day work and it's like, they call them the soft skills. I will call them the power skills. I will call them the hard stuff because this is hard work. I know I work at it on a daily. I can go through Brene Brown. I've done, oh my God, I can't even tell the number of classes now. And each time I go through it, I learn something new going through the process. And so these are some of the things, any of these, you take a class to work on any of these and you build those power skills of self-awareness and who you are and what makes you good is going to help you in the management position. Why? Because one, going through the process will help you help anybody else go to the process or point them in the direction of where they can get help going through the process. You don't have to always be the person. Authenticity and accountability, huge. Braving trust, I get that from Brene Brown, but when you can understand how to break trust down, you can understand how to build it up. Belonging, people have a need for connection and belonging, but here's the kicker. I just did a thing on belonging and I wanted to go, ooh, true belonging is different than fitting in. And a lot of people equate belonging to fitting in, right? I'm doing this because these people will like me and I change who I am so that the people like me. And it's so subtle in work. I used to study how people were um, brought in and the initial intake and onboarding and how do they form their identities. And it is really easy sometimes to start shifting who we are to feel like that's going to gain a status or power in order to get the things done that we need to do. And so it's that fine line between when have I shifted because that's really important, that's who I am. And when have I shifted and I've compromised myself? And again, that dissonance where I don't, I've done something to fit in versus I have really connected with somebody who makes me feel good about who I am, who I feel like I can get really good feedback and really good advice from. Very different. Courage, curiosity, compassion, and cultivating meaning. <sighs> Courage is a skill set. It's learning how to face your fear and come out the other side. Building your curiosity will help you in everything. In fact, I know in the past five years, if you ask me a value, I used to say, knowing knowledge was my number one thing. Like I couldn't see all the books behind me. Like I couldn't get enough information, but all of a sudden I realized that I use my knowledge sometimes to be like, no, I know it. I know the answer to that. I know that. And it was like, damn, I reached this point and I just was like, God, I need curiosity. 
I can have all the knowledge in the world, but I have to reach that person where they're at with what they're doing. And I don't know any of that. I just know what I know. And so I have to reach in with curiosity and find out what they're dealing with, find out what they've done, and then potentially go, hey, you want a couple suggestions? I might have a couple. Curiosity. Direction. Now, this isn't the same type of direction of here's my goal and I'm going to run a mile in four minutes. Okay, a little unrealistic, right? Um, but I'm moving in the direction that is aspirational. It doesn't mean I'm going to need it. And it's not perfectionistic. It's not going to make me feel worse about who I am. It's going to make me feel better as I continue to win things that help me move in that direction. Empathy and extreme ownership. God, these are on the extremes here. I need to be able to connect with others. And yet at the same token, I would say compassion is the key because we not only need to connect, but we have to help move people forward. I can't just go, oh God, that sucks. I have to go, God, that sucks. I totally understand. I'm here. How do I help you? What does support look like? And we start moving into the fact of in any situation, there's certain things that I know I can own. At the point that I don't own it, I become a victim. And when I'm in victim mode, I'm not going to get anywhere. And that's really, that's another one of those. Ee, ee. Well, that was really not out. That was outside of my control. Absolutely. But even though it's outside of your control around it, what could I do to make the situation better, even though I can't change that. But if we go, God, that was outside of my control and I'm completely helpless. Now I'm sunk. Even the stats, again, when I was in my master's degree, we studied the work of women who had been raped. And those women who felt like they could not do anything, like in, in new knowledge, anything, stop what happened, were sunk. They couldn't make it through. But if for some reason they felt like I gained enough that I would never let that happen to me again, they felt like they could get through it. And so when we can own something, even if something's out of our control, if we can own something that makes it better, we get better. Now, feedback. They all say feedback. And I was like, oh my God, I had the greatest thing yesterday. I was working with a gal and she said, yeah, feedback alone is kind of like conflict. It's a word that if we were to map the brain, it would like light up in ways that go, ooh, feedback. And I'm telling you, I'm dreading it right now. I'm going to have feedback with Brene Brown. And I'm like, I just cringe when I get rid of this point. Love the class, love where we're at, but I cringe waiting to see what they're going to say about the feedback I receive. The gal said, the best way for me to go about it is let's compare notes. And I was like, damn, like it comes from like music. It comes from dance situations where they're doing something and a person's taking notes on the things that need to change. And they come back down to it and say, yeah, you were late coming in at this point. You need to come in here or, you know, whatever it is. And so if we come at it with this idea of we both have notes about what happened, let's compare our notes. You tell me a few things, I'll tell you a few. Now it's like this exchange of information about progress versus feedback. Like I have an opinion that's going to make you better. No, I'm just taking notes about what happened out there. And you take notes and let's compare our notes. Let's, let's find ways to work through it. All right. Oof, we're right up on the hour. Um, last slide I'll show. And there's There were some other slides, you'll get them. This comes from... Corn Ferry. Corn Ferry is an amazing leadership training group. And these were what they called as the building blocks for self-assessment and self-awareness areas where if you work on these, they will help you in your leadership. So in looking at this, all I'd say is pick one. If you were to look at it and go, God, I need that one right now. That one would really help me pick one and work on it until you feel like you get a little bit more mastery in it and then go, okay, this semester, oh, I think I need that one and pick that one. You don't have to do them all. You're never going to be strong in all of them. You could work on three or four of them and then go, oh God, now that's my weak link and to go back to one that you've already worked on. But it's about results agility, being able to look at challenges and meet the results, self-awareness, always raising an understanding of who you are, mental agility, that ability to look at problems from different perspectives, um, you want classes in that, go take an improv class, latest fun thing, or take a class on storytelling. Those will help your mental agility. People agility, skilled communicator. How do we learn new skill sets to help us communicate with others? Challenge agility, uh, uh, agility. And that's about being able to move into your not comfortable zone. Like how do we move out of our comfort zone into new things? 
And that can happen outside of work by taking a dance class or learning a new musical instrument or doing a hike, gearing up for a hike, gearing up for a ride, doing any of those type of things where we're doing something that's a little bit maybe on the physical challenge and mental challenge at the same time. And that helps us deal with change or learn how to deal with change because we can have this micro success of doing something new and learning it and feeling like ah, I'm making progress because sometimes you don't get it at work. You got to get it somewhere. Um, so any questions? We're on the hour. Anything strike you that you go, God, if you could give another class on this and you can either type in the chat, what would it be? Or a slide that you would like to look at again. Lots of information. I think the whole idea of understanding how the day to day contributes to the outcome is something that's really difficult to do. <laughs> uh, so you have to probably be very, very intentional about like thinking about that every day so that you don't get into that mindset of is what I'm doing worth doing. Okay, that's a great one. And then did you see in the chat too, Pam, we have the results agility as well as the psychological safety um, were topics of interest as well. Okay, awesome. Yeah, psychological safety is a big one. Um, one thing that you just mentioned right there at the end that was kind of like an aha moment for me was your the, the viewpoint you had on feedback and how that can look like conflict is something that that struck out to me we're in the process of you know creating some feedback sessions so i can hear feedback from our working learners and from the the supervisors participating in the work plus program and i intentionally am having our working learners and the student employees help me plan our working learner feedback session and the first thing they both told me separately they said abby you are making this too formal this is this is scary to a student so they're helping me just keep that in mind and bringing more of the, the fun aspect to it and not making it seem as, like you said, Pam, like a conflict with the with feedback. Yeah, lots of stuff. Um, and in regards to Renee, what you said, there is how to have a good day, which starts to get into some of the time management aspects of how do we manage through our day-to-day -day what we have to get done and how do we start squeezing in a few of the things that we need to get done for ourselves as well. Um, yeah, and I, I I have have a good day on my show if I give you a presentation. In fact, Kristen, I know, did it a couple times and I had to sub for her once when we were in LWD. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another great one. And you can actually sign up for, um, and if I, Renee, I'll send you the link for it. She has an ongoing podcast and website where you can actually sign up and just listen to um, some short podcasts about things that can help you. So I'll cue you in on that one. And I know we are just a little past the one o'clock hour. So if there's any final thoughts or questions um, that you all may have for Pam, um, otherwise, Pam, you did say you were going to, to give me a copy of the slide deck, right? That I could share with everyone. Yep, I'll give everyone. you a slide okay. deck. Um, I'll give you the stuff on values. Yes. We kind of briefly did that. And then I will also include a link for the um, How to Have a Good Day um, Wonderful. podcast. So some more things to continue to look at. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Pam, uh, for taking the time to meet with us today and give us some, some insights on this middle management piece. Um, again, well, thanks thank to all of you because you guys are the ones in the front lines. Or I should mm -hmm. say in the middle lines, <laughs> holding both the upper lines and the lower lines together at times. And that is not an easy spot to be in. So I hope something from today encourages you to keep going because you do a lot and keep this university running. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.